The Spirit of the living God, if you've said yes to Jesus, is in you and always seeking to manifest fruit and life into every aspect of your life and your being everywhere. And we just went through a series where we talked about if you're not seeing it, it's not because God is withholding. If, if it's something directly related to the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice, death, burial, and resurrection, if He paid for it legally, it's yours now. The only thing that might be stopping it is your hardness of heart. Amen. Not because you're evil, not because you're in sin per se, although sin hardens the heart. Amen. But the hardness of heart is mostly manifest in unbelief. Did God really say, is God really that faithful? Is, you know, can I really depend on God? Will he actually, if I need it, will he send some dude to my house with $600 worth of food? You're going to remember that. I will. So, but it's all about the word. It's all about tilling the heart. Make sure that you're receptive. Make sure that inside of you is good soil for that word, that promise, that life to grow into. And you're the, probably the, the best thing that you can do is just stay at peace inwardly. And you stay at peace by knowing who God is and knowing his heart towards you. Amen. You know, last we wrapped up that last series on the idea that they were... Their heart, Jesus said to the disciples who uh, didn't multiply the food and couldn't get the boy healed and things like that that they were supposed to do because he'd given them the power to do. And then he said, it's because your heart is hard. And he said, you didn't understand the miracle of the loaves. And to me, the biggest thing to understand about the miracle of the loaves is what Jesus thought was thinking right before he did that miracle. And that was, these people are exhausted. They're tired. They're worn out. They're hungry. They, a lot of them can't afford to go buy food. I have to feed them because if they walk away from here now, they might collapse on their way to go try to find food. I don't want that. And, and you just see the heart of Jesus for people. Amen. Now, food is everything, meaning it's life's provision, it's actual food, healing. Whatever it is that Jesus displayed toward anyone, he wants it for you. And that's his heart. I don't want them to walk away in lack. I want them to walk away having their needs met. That's just, that's just it. Amen. But if that is not your understanding of God's heart toward you, if that is not your, uh, your conviction in whatever it is that you're facing, then the work that you are to do is to trust God inwardly, till up the garden of your heart, make that soil receptive, and one of the ways is just is read the Word. Say, read the Word. Read the Word. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. <laughs> so basically, that's what I want to talk about today. Is I'm just going to go through. I'm actually going to read a lot of Scripture. But think of it in terms of, you know, there's... Did you get that? Okay. There's so much in the Word that uh, you have to give yourself permission that when you're reading it, whatever jumps off the page in that moment is alive in that moment. Run with that. You know, it's good to read line upon line, precept upon precept. In fact, when I'm studying a particular concept, if it's in a book, I will go and I will watch, I will make sure that I understand the audience of that book, the context of why whoever wrote that book wrote that letter. You know, kind of get a perspective of what is, what's, why is this written? Who is it written to? What would the original readers have thought? How would they have received it? Is there anything in there that's not for me that was specifically for them? And what part, the, like the last question is what part of it is for me? But we jump in there and think, what am I supposed to do? And you read the Bible with the mindset, I got to figure out what do I have to do. So, forgetting, you know, and we forget the fact that Jesus is the living word. So the Bible is important. Amen? Amen. But a relationship with Jesus is more important. But the Bible, anything that you think that you learn from Jesus will also be verified in the Bible. It's a circle, the spirit and the word. Amen? All right, so... I just want to look at this, and, and what you're looking at is God spoke. God's word is alive. From the very beginning, he spoke out his ways, his logic. 
you know, his, his expectations, his character, his power, he spoke it out. And that continues to uphold everything. All the systems that exist are up, upheld by his, uh, the authority of his logic that he put out there. And, you know, so we try to interact with that, but you can't really fully understand the vastness of everything that he's done. But we can understand Jesus. Because Jesus, it's like, it's like everything that God thinks, believes, the character behind who God is, his authority, his power, his integrity, that all, all of everything about God manifested into one person, into Jesus, into a human. And Jesus shows us who God is. And so if you want to understand the Bible, understand Jesus. Amen? Amen. Understand his life, how he treated people understand why he died. That's why we focus so much on the death, burial, and resurrection is so that you understand your place within that. Amen? Um, so all of this we're about to read, and it's kind of a lot, but it's going to be good, is, is about the idea of God revealing himself in Jesus, that Jesus is the living word. Jesus is the testimony of who God is. If you ever read something and you're confused, Look at Jesus and go to him. Amen? Now, there is some confusing bits, and we've taught a lot about that, but to understand when Jesus is reinforcing the law versus when he's speaking new covenant, and it's not that the law, you, it's not that you throw away the teachings of Jesus, but you just realize, oh, he fulfilled that for me. Right. Amen? All right, so starting with this, and this is in the New Living Translation, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and power. Say alive. Alive. Think about that, alive. Now, when you think Word of God, do you think Bible or do you think an aspect of God? Because remember, the Bible is just something that's written down to testify of who God is, but His Spirit is bigger than that. Amen? So for the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit. I love that. You just think about his, who God is, his character, his logic. It rests. It can live where spirit meets soul. Man, I'm telling you, everything is done in spirit, but then it needs to bleed into your soul so that you feel it, believe it, think it, and are motivated by it. Then it affects everything else on your, yeah. the rest of your being. And the Word of God is in that place. It can be. You can call that the heart where spirit meets soul. Yeah. Uh, between joint and marrow, it exposes. It. See, it's, it's, it's spirit soul and body. A lot of people say salvation is just for spirit and that one day it'll be for your body. No, it's for your body too. Amen. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. This is where I want to go today. This, this is the thought that I want you to leave with today is that the Word of God exposes your innermost thoughts and desires. Now, how does that make you feel? Let me just tell you, the Word of God exposes your innermost thoughts and desires. Now, where do your thoughts go? Positive and negative. Positive and negative. Some people, where's the door? You, 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 you're feeling a wave of condemnation roll over you in this moment. I'm telling you, some of you are. Some of you are like, man, it's good that just to get that stuff out of there. It's, and it is both ways, but you have to remember if you feel, if you hear that and then you feel condemned, you have forgotten that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We should desire to get as close to that edge as condemnation as we can because we know there is no condemnation, but it's the point where we become vulnerable before the Lord and He can purge. That's where the real pruning takes place. God doesn't really prune externally where He's clipping away your job and He's clipping away your spouse and He's clipping away your dog and He's clipping away your health. You laugh at dog, but I'm telling you, it's real. It, what He's clipping is inward. The pruning that God does is inward with his word by his spirit. Amen. Amen? When he tested Abraham, how did he test him? Whether or not he would offer Isaac or not, he tested him inwardly. Did Abraham actually have to go through with sacrificing his child? No. 
God was testing him inwardly. In fact, Abraham marched up that hill. It's like, we're going to go over there, and then we're going to come back, Amen. he tells those people. Amen. What do you mean, we're going to come back? Didn't God just ask you to Amen. sacrifice your son, Abraham? God will provide a lamb. Amen. I mean, we read that stuff and we think, well, that's really weird. God wanted him to sacrifice his son. No, it was a matter of the heart. The thing that he cared about the most, are you willing to trust me with that? Right. And so it's not a test per se as much as it is a joining. You know, a, a joining, it, it is a test, but it's a test of like metal where the dross is taken out and all that's left is the purity. God, any testing that God does is inside of you, and it can be uncomfortable because you have to admit things about yourself in that place. And when you read the Word of God, I mean, I'm telling you, like, you like, you've never seen so many squirrels. <laughs> Think about the last time you read your Bible. <laughs> Nobody's brains are smoking, so hopefully that was <laughs> relatively recent. I, I mean, you know, read your Bible or listen to it, whatever, you know. But when you're sitting there and you're reading your Bible, what happens? Well, I've got to take care of this. I've got to take care of that. Or Some of us, it's... If you're nodding off when you're reading your Bible, read it at a different time of day. It's, there's nothing super spiritual about the first thing in the morning. It's okay if you can't do it the, at that time. You know, you're, some people are made to think that if you're not doing it the first thing in the morning, something wrong with you. No, you just might need some more sleep. Whatever. Anyway, but think about it. When you're reading and you run across something, what is it doing to you? Uh, like, are you actually having an encounter with this word? I mean, are you, are you just looking for some information to prove this person wrong? Or are you, are you just looking for information to validate what you think you're right? Or are you using it to condemn yourself about, I'm not doing that. Well, I'm not doing that either. I'm not doing that either. I think I'll put this down for a while. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, sh it should do all of that stuff. But it should also be a guidepost to anchor you back into who you are in Christ. Amen. So that you're letting that word cleanse you and, and go through the process of getting rid of that stuff that's in there. I'm telling you, when you read your Bible, you're going to laugh because you're going to think about this, but you're going to start thinking about that stuff that's as if you're taking a bath and he's pruning, he's clipping, he's getting all that stuff out of there. You know, I get it. You think about things. There's, you got your list. You, got, you have stuff to do. You know, don't be so distracted that you don't have time to read the Word. And when you're reading the Word, you've got so much that you've got to get done. Maybe time to reprioritize and, you know, be a little bit more efficient. But the Word of God, it'll get in there. And we, but we have to understand that it's not just Scripture. It's not just precepts and doctrine and law and, and instruction. This thing is living because it's Jesus. Yes. So here we go. Ready? John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now this word, word, is the Greek word logos, and it's not just written word, and it's not just spoken word. It's like, it's like logic. It's, it's what you would think of when old-timers would say, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you my word. My word is my bond. We're shaking hands, and this is my word. And, and it's because of who backs up that handshake. It's my name that's represented in. If I give you my word, that's because my integrity backs up what I've promised. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about in the beginning was the ideas that are in the Bible, but it is that too, but it's who God is, the character behind who God is. That was God. Through him, all things were made. And see how when it says something like that, because you think, okay, well, if Jesus, how was Jesus through all things? Oh, it's bigger, even bigger than the idea of who Jesus, the man Jesus. It's bigger, it's the whole logic of God, what God knows, what he understands. Like when he makes something, all of the ingenuity that goes behind that thing working, right? Amen. The way of the world in, in his perspective. All of that is this word. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing. But he attaches personality to it. Through him, uh, nothing was made that has been, has been made. Nothing was made that has been made. Okay, verse 4. In him was life. See, not death, not life and death, life. Amen. 
That life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or will not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a... So remember, we're talking about the Word, getting a bigger picture of who Jesus is, understanding that in this relationship, He's exposing in those inner intentions of the heart and those desires, and you're engaging. But I'm showing you a picture of who this is that is doing this within you. Uh, he came to testify and witness concerning that light so that through Him all might believe... He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Wow. He came to, I mean, the, vulner, the, the state of vulnerability he placed himself within. And we're going to, just stick with me. Say, keep going. Keep going. Okay. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Do you believe in His name? Yes. You're a child of God. Yes. Children born of natural descent, nor of uh, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Yes. The Word became flesh, yes. and the very, the very. You can pull that down for just a second. But the very thing that defines Antichrist is that it, de it denies that Jesus, that God came in the flesh. Yes. In other words, that God became a human. Right. That God in human form was tempted and tested and tried and could have sinned. Could Jesus have sinned? Yes. He, he could have he messed up big time because he was a human. Now we're going to get to why he had to become a human. And it's incredibly powerful to me. But you have to know that. Now, a lot of these end-time cults, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, a lot of those people, they pervert who Jesus is, that he wasn't a human. That is Antichrist by very definition. It, the, the spirit of Antichrist denies that Jesus came in the flesh. Are you with me? All right. So that's just kind of a side note. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. Why is that important? Because... G, everything that Jesus went through as a human and gained victory over, He did it for you. So you, as a human, can walk in His authority. Amen? Amen? Yes. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because He was before me. Out of His fullness, we, all, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. And he's talking about law. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Amen. See, truth came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. In other words, the capacity and the ability to live within God's expectations, not for righteousness, but for victory, came through Jesus. Amen. Are you with me? Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is Himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made Him known. If there's an aspect of God that you are trying to wrestle with and it doesn't make sense with who Jesus is, bring it to Jesus. Line it up with what you've seen of Him and, and understand God through that. All right, Hebrews 1. I'm going to just kind of break up where we're going through here. But Hebrews 1, 2, 3, and 4, and that's going to be your homework this week. Read your Bible. <laughs> In the past, God spoke. Uh, so again, we're talking about word, okay? When God spoke, that is logos. That is God speaking his wisdom into existence and, and speaking uh, prophetically to the pre-cross prophets and sages. So this is what he's talking about. We're still talking about the Word. We're still talking about the, the character of God being spoken, which ultimately within us prunes and brings us to a place of vulnerability where we can just let that stuff go. You can be honest with yourself. Right. I'm telling you, one of the hardest things for a Christian to do is be honest with themselves. Yeah. You'd be surprised. It takes a lot of time sometimes to be able to just cut through all the stuff and just lay it out there. 
Because we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to be God to ourselves. We're trying to be the Holy Spirit and trying to give ourselves understanding rather than just cracking that heart open, laying there before God and saying, God, you know, this, this is me. And just, and just let him expose everything for the purpose of cleaning it out because he's good and he will. And he will leave you shining bright to the glory of his name. So in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, 2,000 years ago, he's calling it last days. It's interesting. I don't know. Things that make you go, hmm. Anyway, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If anybody tries to prophesy to you, it should testify of Jesus. Amen. Amen? Amen. You know, I mean, if they see unicorns and butterflies and silvery lakes or any of that kind of stuff, that's fine. Jesus I'm just looking to see who's had those kind of prophecies given to them. Here. Anyway, <laughs> but it should ultimately bring you to Jesus Amen. in some way. Amen. Uh, but in these last days is spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. What does that make you think of? If Jesus is an heir of all things, what does that mean to you? You're a joint heir with Jesus. And through whom also he made the universe. Again, the word, the logic, the character of God, that living thing that made the universe pierces deep within you where soul meets spirit and is alive. If God can make a hundred billion galaxies with a hundred billion stars or trillion, I don't know, my number is John, what is it, hundred trillion or billion? It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, that same logic is in you, and it knows how you think, it knows what you need, it knows where to lead you and how to lead you, and it is not trying to lead you into darkness or confusion or death or sickness. It's trying to lead you into ultimately what Jesus prayed for, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So, I mean, you just get this picture of this Jesus. That he's just so much bigger than we've even grasped, you know. Sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Why? He's done. He's done. <laughs> so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Uh, then he goes on through several references from Psalms, Deuteronomy, 2 Samuel, all of which are pointing to Jesus as the fulfillment of the words that God had spoken through the prophets. Um, so he's heavily pulling on the word, speaking to these people that had value for ancient manuscripts or scrolls to show them, okay, all of that is pointing us to Jesus. Hebrews uh, 2, verse 1. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Specifically about Jesus being the word, okay? Okay. He goes on to talk about the importance of Jesus becoming human, just like John did when he said the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is interesting. If you go and you read through John chapter 1 and like the first four chapters of Hebrews, it's like this perfect harmony. Yes. Said different, in different ways, but it's exactly the same. Do that. Go and read John 1 and then Hebrews 1 through 4 and watch how they blend together, specifically who this Jesus is. All right. So Hebrews 2.14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. A lot of people miss this. I mean, I'm telling you, a lot of people miss this, but there is so much power for you to understand as a human that Jesus did this on your behalf and gives you the victory. See, because if you think about Jesus as God, not human, then he's special and you can't do what he did. Right? He's different. There's something different about Jesus when he was here that disqualifies me from living that way. In some people's minds, it's even sacrilegious to think that way, that I am just like Jesus is now when he was here as a human. 
and even in spirit now. Now, you're not God. You're not going to become a God. Jesus was never dead in his sin and had to be reborn other than when he died on that cross and went into Hades and was birthed out of that. He experienced it at that point for you. But look, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Now think about that. The next time you're facing something and you think God feels like he's far away, he's been there. Amen. Jesus has been there. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds power, of the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. If you can overcome the fear of death, there's nothing that can bring fear into your life. Amen. Hebrews 3, we're going to keep going. Uh, verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, Amen. whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. See, this, then this concept of Jesus as high priest comes in, which is very significant to who he's speaking to. And I've heard it said, well, just thinking isn't enough. No, it's not. Thinking to the point that you changes your inner world and beliefs and actions, of course, but you don't change anything without it being alive within your thoughts. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind. I know this is a lot, but it's for one thing and one thing only, and that is that your relationship with God, including your reading of His Word, the Bible, should bring you to the place where you're exposing yourself because you trust that this amazing God that made everything is able to do things within you now. Verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Now, when we read something like that, we think about actions. But when Jesus told the disciples that they were uh, a wicked and perverse generation, it was because they couldn't get a boy healed. Well, that's hardcore. It's not about you being a good or bad person. It's about are you in faith toward God? Amen. Do you trust God? Amen. That's the issue that Jesus has. So um, <clears throat> verse 13 But encourage one another daily. That testimony encouraged me. Did it encourage you? Daily. Be, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. Now, when it talks about those that uh, overcome, it's talking about being faithful to the end, not necessarily your actions, but somebody was thinking that. So, Verse 15, as has just been said, to, as said today if, your heart, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Now that's a throwback. He's talking to the children of Israel, the Israelites that were delivered from Egypt, wandered in the desert for 40 years because of their hardness of heart, not because God needed them to suffer to get them to the promised land. Their hearts were not at a place where they could go into the promised land and be inspired by God and empowered by God to kill a bunch of giants. It took 40 years to get to that generation where they would believe God and go and inherit that promised land. Some of you have been wandering in the desert not able to receive the promise because your heart can't receive it. Not because God's withholding it from you. So what do you do? You become convinced of who Jesus is. And then all things are possible. Amen? Amen. So then, then he talks about, it's, so let me just say, he's, he's saying stay true to what God has spoken. Remember uh, the God has spoken to us through the life, death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Hebrews 4, 9, and we're getting to the end here. Hang tight. Hebrews 4, 9. There remain, and so this is what we're going to now is that you see that the vastness of who God is is perfectly expressed in Jesus and the logic that is that makes up Jesus is alive within you and it digs deep down within you and it exposes all of this stuff and it cleans you up inward. Now you're perfect in spirit, but your heart might have some stuff you got to deal with and get rid of. It's time to deal with your stuff. Amen. 
Amen? Say, I'm going to deal with my stuff. But you're going to deal with it knowing that the God that made everything, that manifested himself as a human and showed you who he is in Jesus, is with you and is alive in you and will walk you through this process. He's pretty smart. There remains, there, there, uh, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from His. Let us therefore make every effort to enter into that rest. And it's like a paradox. Work to rest. The work that you do is laying yourself open, being honest with letting this stuff out. Because the Spirit of God will become in you what you need to be to move through whatever that thing is that you're facing. So that's what we have to know, that, that everything is seed time and harvest. Amen? Yeah. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that, none of, so, that not, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. See, earlier he said unbelief. Now he's saying disobedience. Unbelief is disobedience. If you believe, you will obey. But the belief comes first. If you try to obey God without the belief, you're legalistic and you think you can work your way. Then you will think God owes you. And you have thought God owes you at times. I know this because you've sat and you've prayed, God, I've been given, but I don't have enough money. You thought that you obeyed your way into blessing, but it's about the belief. You didn't believe. Obedience without belief is death. It's frustration. Amen. Verse 12, for the word of God is alive yeah. and active. I love the word active. Powerful, active. The word of God is active in you right now. Active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what we talk about in our household, attitude. It's like, you guys are amazing. I mean, you are stellar, but you got to deal with your attitude right now. Don't be coming downstairs with that chip on your shoulder. I realize that you did this, and you did this, and this happened, and this, and you're amazing. I don't take anything about it, but watch your attitude because it affects everything. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes, before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, if you hear law in that, watch out. That's not what he's talking about. There is an element of that that, you know, your actions are judged for reward's sake, not for righteousness' sake. But anyway, I'm packing a lot in here. Verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Now, on verse 14 there, a lot of you know, you may or may not know, I've got a website, it's just my name, clintbyers.com, and there's, there's, I don't know, there's like almost 60 teaching sets on there. Um, if you go to that web page and click on free teaching sets, uh, like genius title, right? There's a bunch of them in there. There's one in there called um, Exchanging Natures with Jesus, where I go through this process of what it means for Jesus to be our high priest. I think there's even one in there called Jesus, our high priest. But exchanging natures with Jesus was one of my favorite ones. Go through that stuff, you know. Use that resource. It's out there. Not that I've got it all figured out, but that's just what this place has to offer. So, uh, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. You know, he goes through this whole process of showing you that the vastness of who he is and that it is his spoken word that has created and upholds everything. And he, and he shows you as big as you can possibly think, the mind that it must take to have created all of that, that came into existence as a human. And it came into existence as a human so it could empathize with your humanity. And it destroyed everything that is destroying your humanity 
and he put his spirit within you, which is the reflect, which is the spirit that made all of that stuff and makes it work. And that spirit, that word, that logic, that compassion, that integrity toward humans, because it knows what it's like to be a human, is at work within you, actively seeking to bring you to rest. And that's the point of what he's talking about there. It's not so that you'll finally straighten up and do right, although that is a byproduct. You ought to straighten up and do right so that you represent God well, but that's not the goal. The goal is so that all of that process will bring you into a place of rest so that you cease from your own labors of trying to earn your way into God's acceptance, of trying to earn God's blessing, of trying to be good enough for whatever it is that you're believing for, like Adam was talking about. If you have that sense of it's just no, not quite there, I've got this missing, but once I get this straightened out, then I'll be okay. Well, that might be true of your physical life, but that's not true of who you are in spirit. And if you lay that part of you open and bare before God, it will work on you. So all of that to come down to one idea, and I kind of already touched on it, crack that Bible, open that thing, and read it. By the way, read the New Testament. <laughs> if you feel led to go back to the old, that's fine. I'm not throwing the old away. It's valid. It's real. It's as powerful and authoritative as the new. However, you got to know who Jesus is. Yeah, right. Just feel your, like for the next year, just go through the New Testament. Just read through it or however it works for you. Go to thebibleproject.com and, and watch the videos that set up the books so that you understand what the book is written for, and then read that book. But read it from a perspective of it's like you're, you're going to go through this process of not how do I become better. It's God has already completed me in spirit, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this word work within me, and as I'm assimilating it and thinking about it, these squirrels that are running... I'm going to let them run, but I'm going to sit within his word so that it will bring me to rest. Amen. If it brings you to feeling like you've got more work to do, you're doing it wrong. Now, I don't mean like if you're reading it and it's like you get a word that you should be a missionary to Uganda. I'm not saying that that kind of work shouldn't be birthed. You know what I'm saying? We are created unto good works. When it says that you're to cease from your works, it doesn't mean you just sit on the couch and never do anything again. And if Jesus wanted to live through you, then he would just kind of magically live through you and make you do something. You know what I'm saying? I like for those people believe that, that their life is Jesus living through them now, and so whatever they're doing is what Jesus would do through them. It's, that's weird. So that's weird. weird. Did I lose you about 10 minutes ago? <laughs> Read it to come to rest. Amen. Read it to come to a place of settledness rooted and grounded in Him, letting His life be birthed within you, not judging yourself. Let the Word judge you. If you feel condemned, remind yourself, I'm not condemned. I'm in Christ. Christ is safe. The salvation of Christ is safe. He's in God. That's true of me too. Do the work to get yourself to where that feels true to you, and then once it feels true, then it can actually work within you and make things happen. I mean, the word, when you go through that process, your desires will change. I mean, some people think, well, I've got this, I've got this black dog and I've got this white dog and whichever one I'm feeding is the one that's going to win. You ain't got no black dog in you. <laughs> you don't have a propensity toward sin because that root was taken out of you. You only sin because you think about it. Hello. Right. Quit thinking about it. Think about who you are in Christ and that will lead you and guide you. And if you still, if you crave that stuff, it's because you don't, you haven't owned your identity and who you are in Him. Your desires can change. Amen. Your desires can change. Yes. Yes. I'm telling you, this is a big deal. What you desire inside can change. And it will reflect the truth of who you are in spirit. I mean, we think that Christianity is just like, I'm just going to do the best I can and slide my way into heaven. No, you can live victoriously in this life. The Word of God can do such a deep and powerful work within you that you become unrecognizable to the old dead man. Amen. I mean, those things that you're struggling with, those things that make you afraid and worry now, 
that stuff can change. It's called transformation. Do you believe that? Like, do you believe that you can be a person that will no longer worry about money? It's true. God can do such a deep work within you that you become so dependent and so confident of who He is and his, as a provider, you don't even worry anymore. Amen. What would it be like if you never worried about money ever again? I don't mean because you, get, you got a big pile. See, that's where you went. In your mind you think, well, that means I got a big old pile of cash over here. Then I ain't worried about it. Nope. That's deceptive too. Riches are deceitful one way or the other. You don't have enough. It's deceitful thinking that you'll feel complete when you get it. And you got a bunch of it. It's deceitful in thinking, I got enough. This is good. It's both ways. But if you just didn't worry about it, content. Amen? That, that's what, that's, that's, I know I've said a lot, read a lot, but it should bring you to the place of when I go into the Word, when I engage with God, when I'm allowing this work to happen within me, it's to bring me to a place of rest, to bring me to a place of trust, in His finished work, so that I'm, rather than choking that word and trying to squeeze coconut oil out of a coconut, <laughs> you're liberally letting the life of God flow through you and bring abundance. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you. We thank you so much. We will rest in your word. We, got, we make a commitment to you and to ourselves that when we engage your word, when we engage your Bible, or when we just think about the vastness of who you are, we will allow it to bring us to a place of rest. Rest knowing that we're co-laborers with you. We're just walking with you, following you into life, into blessing, so that we can be a blessing, so that you would be glorified through us. We thank you for your peace. You know, maybe you're in here or you're watching.